Thrift, Brent Ayler, and Edwin Evers, who won the 2019 Major League Fishing Red Crest in La Crosse, Wisconsin. The championship round of the 2019 Red Crest started off quickly, with several anglers able to catch scoreable bass after sir. bass. Yes, sir. I'm gonna put one in now. Three pounds, one ounce. I feel like any hook six is going to be a four or five pounder. There's a big one. There's a big one. That's what I expected to catch in here right here, boys. Check this one out. Get in the boat. Yes. Yeah, that's a nice one there. Yeah, that's a big one. Luckily, there's one. Nah, not that good. Better. Just hope I can keep it going, you know. I don't know, but I'm, I'm liking what I'm seeing. In the third period, Edwin Evers went on a massive flurry that never seemed to let up, and he never looked oh, back yeah. on his way to becoming the 2019 Red Crest champion. The last time the pro circuit was in lacrosse was in 2017. Local favorite Matthew Steffen started out strong on the first day with 18 pounds even. The final two days featured some of the best known anglers in fishing, like David Dudley, Joshua Weaver, and the goat himself, Andy Morgan. Good chunk. Let me catch this fish. Catch him again. That's an old chunk. <laughs> yeah, baby. Yes, sir. That's the kind of get you back in it. If history is any indication, the 2020 FLW Tackle Warehouse Pro Circuit Super Tournament in La Crosse, Wisconsin is sure to please, with 15 plus pound bags likely to be thrown onto the scales each day. There's no telling who will come out on top in a fishery like the Mississippi River where any and all tactics will be in play. As Major League Fishing and FLW Pro Circuit anglers unite to create oh, one of the God. largest fields in bass fishing, it truly is anyone's game. Welcome bass fishing fans to La Crosse, Wisconsin. There is a look at the beautiful upper Mississippi River and our field of uh, 203 anglers getting ready to blast off this morning, hanging tight due to the fog delay on our first day of stop number five in the Tackle Warehouse Pro Circuit presented by Optima Batteries and our second of three super tournaments where we have combined MLF anglers with the FLW family to create these super events for the remainder of the 2020 Pro Circuit season. Good morning, everyone. I'm Travis Moran, live here at the FLW studios in Benton, Kentucky, alongside some familiar faces, Red Gold Tomatoes Pro Todd Hollowell and MLF's very own Marty Stone. Guys, last month, our, our first super event, Lake Chickamauga, what a fantastic turnout that was. It really was. It lived up to every expectation that we could possibly have. We saw the rising stars in the FLW Pro Circuit do their thing. Jason Rios, a veteran on there, and then Jacob Wheeler lighting it up. And I mean lighting it up. A Chickamauga showed off. It's a big bass factory. And with all that's going on in our country right now, uh, what, what an awesome place to be sitting here getting ready to watch some more fishing. I'm glad to be back. I know you guys are glad to be back. It's going to be a great week in lacrosse. Yeah, absolutely. And before we jump out on the Mississippi River, let's take a look back here at some of these fish catches out of our anglers at Lake Chickamauga, starting with John Cox. I don't know if there's a hotter fisherman uh, on, on any circuit right now than John Cox. When everyone was talking about this uh, 
ledge fishing tournament that this was going to be. John Cox did what, uh, you know, went the other way, went shallow, threw a frog, and came up with some amazing fish catches. John Cox had a lot of success at Lake Chickamauga in the past and really did it his way. He always does it his way everywhere he goes. We were really surprised at how this event started off on uh, the first day in the rain. John catching monsters on a frog, Marty. Making a big gamble this week, though. Unfortunately, he's not going to be here with us. With all the scheduling conflicts that's happened, he's having a step in New York. He's trying to be an angler that's going to make the FLW Championship and the Bassmasters Classic. Here he's third place in the points in great shape. He's got some work to do over there on the bass side. We're going to miss him this week and wish him nothing but the best in this tournament over there. You bet. Miles Berghoff, a guy sitting in 10th in the points right now on Angler of the Year, had a great event at Chickamauga, moved to Soddy Daisy, Tennessee, has been putting his time in on the Tennessee River, uh, and, and really he made, he made hay when the sun was shining, so to speak, here at Chickamauga. A giant fish right there. Uh, we watched Miles catch an eight-pounder, one of those great Lake Chickamauga uh, F1 hybrids, and uh, that'll put a smile on anybody's face. Miles looking to make a run for Angler of the Year. And Marty, how about this guy out of the West Coast, one of your MLF anglers that's fishing these super tournaments? One of the most consistent anglers that we've got on tour on the FLW side. He's got about an 82% in the money finishes. And then he's come over to the Bass Pro Tour and it's just delivered time and time again. I truly think Cody's fishing at one of the highest levels I've ever seen him fish at. And I've said now for the last 12 months, this guy's getting ready to win, and when he does, he's going to win a lot of events in a short period of time. Instinctually, one of the best fishermen I've ever seen mechanically is sound. There's no holes in this game. I look for him to have another great event this week here at Lacrosse, Mississippi. And how about Jason Reyes? Watching him fish was like a sweet little old lady playing the slot machines. Just slow and steady, and all of a sudden, some huge payouts. And we watched him really soak that Cinco for, uh, for long periods of time. But then it would be pure madness when he'd finally hook up. And Jason settled into just one main area and, and fished like it was Texas or like it was Florida. He said Jason was a guy that came into Chickamauga, Marty, looking, uh, he was on the outside looking in at this, this title, top 50 in the points, but he had the event that makes a guy's season. We're looking at him coming into this event, 43rd in the points. Uh, great event for Jason Reyes, charging up into the mix. He wants to make it to that title championship. He wants to catch him for his family, he told us. And uh, what a great event for him. And then I don't know, I, I don't know where to begin with this angler right now. Uh, just a, a fantastic turnout by him uh, on for this first of three super tournaments. Well, Marty, I, I just, <laughs> catch us up. I mean, this guy, he's winning everywhere he goes right now. So the last count, and I'm probably going to be off a little bit, last 15 events, he's made nine championships. That's a career for some people. 2020, he was first at Ufala, third at Okeechobee, slipped up, was 43rd at Okeechobee, then ninth at Kissimmee, first at Toyota Series, first at FLW, super event that we had. This guy's winning everything. I don't care if it's no limits or if it's five fish limit and oh yeah Chickamauga by the way he actually won the big fish make the rules and here's what shows up great anglers show up no matter what the rules are this kid right here is one of the hottest in the business you're really seeing him in his prime Marty I've been I've been watching this kid since he was 12 years old and the thing about Wheeler is he puts in the time he told us at Lake Chickamauga he put more time into preparing for that event than any event he's fished uh, in recent memory, and it certainly paid off. He got the win on what he considers to be his home lake at Chickamauga, Travis. Unreal! It's a he was pretty much. Pounder. It's a goddamn dead pounder! Unbelievable! Oh, it's like a little baby. That's bigger than my daughter. Unreal! Absolutely amazing event out of Jacob Wheeler. Pleasure to watch, and I'm sure he's planning on trying to do it again here at uh, the Mississippi River, guys. Can we say back-to-back -back jacks? Uh, I mean, when we come into this event, we're talking about our favorites and everything, and I don't hear us talking about his name enough, in my opinion, <laughs> myself included. He's not the first one I, I migrate to, but when you're this hot, 
it's not unfathomable to think that he can win back-to-back -back tournaments. Yeah, truly on another level right now than a lot of guys, Travis. And uh, a lot going on in the world, but this week it's all about the Super Tournaments. So. Yeah, absolutely. Now let's uh, shift our focus over to this second Super Tournament of the season here on the Mississippi River. Why don't you break down some of the key areas that are going to play uh, here uh, in Wisconsin? Yeah, you know, lacrosse is a, is a huge playing field. Uh, we're going to take a look at the map here. We're on the upper Mississippi. Uh, lacrosse, you know, three pools that are going to come into play here. Pool 7, uh, you're going to see up to the north of takeoff where we're going to be in pool 8. We're taking off out of Stoddard about halfway down to pool 8 and then the guys can lock down to pool 9 as well. So three pools in play, two locks, a lot of options. Uh, you know, the, all of these pools set up a, very similarly, Marty. We've got the river up top delta area with a lot of backwaters and chutes uh, in the middle portion and then it kind of forms a lake and a basin down at the bottom but uh, lots of options two different species and a lot of different uh, cover that these guys can explore this week. Todd you're 100 percent right this is an area where cats and dogs do coexist small mouth and large mouth they run together they, and, and you'll catch one and then you'll catch the other species as well but when I break down the cover on this thing I'm looking here main river and in the main river, it's all about the current. It's the current in the river, and then what can break that current? Is it the form of riprap, a wing dam, a rock pile, uh, we have spillways, bridges, laydowns, sand points? The key is, is that river has got to have the current break, and wherever you got current breaks at, then the bait fish will congregate in there, and the bass will migrate to that. You can catch both largemouth and smallmouth on the main river. Then there's what I call the backwaters and also the secondary channels. And that's where you're going to see the boat docks, the marinas, the riprap walls. And when you get true backwater, then it becomes about the aquatic vegetation, whether it's the coontail, millful, pencil reeds. And eelgrass is going to be a major player this week. And this river is loaded with it. It's even choked out a lot of the native vegetation in the form of coontail and the hydrilla. And the eelgrass is packed with duck weeds as well. So you really have distinct, very distinct options on this, whether it's the main channel looking for a current break or you're in the backwater secondary channels looking for an area that a fish can live under. Yeah, lots of variables going on, guys. Uh, it's going to be fun once we get out on the water this morning seeing what these anglers go to and what starts to play immediately. Um, we're on a little bit of a fog delay right now, so these anglers are, are still waiting to blast off. But, guys, we have plenty of live coverage today for the next six hours. But then over the next four days, we're going to have uh, six cameras bringing you live coverage from the top anglers throughout this tournament. And uh, once again, we're going to be live on our social media platforms, Facebook and YouTube, for the first hour. And then at 9 a.m., we'll be moving over just to the FLWFishing.com um, uh, streaming where you can watch free and you can also get your uh, live uh, unofficial leaderboard updates there. So we're looking forward to uh, lots of live coverage. Once again, that's going until 2 o'clock today. And then at 3 p.m., we'll go back live on FLWFishing.com for the weigh-in with Chris Jones and uh, see who these anglers are going to be getting closer to moving on, making that top 50 and fishing the third day. Um, but guys, fog delay. These anglers, they've been pre-fishing. They're ready to, to lay this all out right now. Um, what goes through your mind when you run into this fog delay, when you're antsy, anxious? What's going on right now with these anglers? Yeah, we got a lot of things, too, that we really haven't talked about on the fog delay. And, and one is the length of day. So you're sitting there as an angler, and, and you're looking at, am I going to lock up? Am I going to lock down? How is this going to affect my day? Is it going to make it shorter? Will they extend the day? Historically, on big fields, by fish events, they don't extend the day. So now you're dealing with, am I going to lock up and down, deal with the barge traffic in there, and have even a shorter day. Todd, you and I have heard a lot of anglers talk about if there's barges around, now you take a 30 minute process, turn it into a two hour process, you lose an hour or two on the front end of your day and add in a possible two hour delay because of barge traffic, it really changes the game right there. And so when you're talking about what's going through your mind, a lot of stuff very fast. Yeah, the, we've got rookies, we've got veterans, we've got guys who are just coming to lacrosse for their first time. 
And, and this place is overwhelming. I remember the first time I was here and you're getting stuck in your boat and you're afraid to run around and, and there's just a lot of thing go, things going through these guys' minds. Then we have veterans. We have guys from on this major league fishing circuit that have been here several times and they're very confident. What I talked to uh, some of the guys last night, there was a timing to the bite. A lot of guys were talking about, you know, it's summer and a lot of times first thing in the morning, that first hour or two is, is critical. and and. Some of these guys only found one or two places and, and they're missing out right now on what they felt like was their best bite of the day. So some guys I think are sitting in that fog delay, you know, chewing their fingernails, nervous, maybe a little scared. And then you've probably got another group of, of veteran anglers uh, that are very confident and, and they know they're going to catch them as soon as they let them go. The common thought that I heard a lot of guys talk about was this is a different Mississippi than what they've been to in the past. The guys I talked to with a lot of experience this place was renowned, 40, 50 bike days. I didn't hear that. I heard a couple anglers talk about, I've got a place, a place being 20 yards by 30 yards, and it's a small area, got multiple bikes in that, but you could fish miles on this river right now and not get bit. So shorten a day, tougher river. Now, now we just turned up the pressure, and oh yeah, by the way, this is the last two events to get those being the top 50 to make that FLW championship, pressure has just been turned up. Well, Marty, you're making a great point right now. Let's talk about what's at stake for these anglers because as we've combined the MLF with the FLW for these super tournaments, we've increased the payouts. There's a lot on stake for the AOI race. Let's go over some of those things for our audience. Yeah, when you look at the super tournament on this thing and we've combined both worlds, you know, the Bass Pro Tour guys are over here and they're fishing for the money. They, they've come over here just straight up, let's just call it what it is, they're fishing for the money. And I'm going to add to that. Last time we were together at Chickamauga, I think the FLW Pro Circuits more than held their own. And if it was a boxing match, I would have probably even give the edge to them. So there's a little bit of pride coming over here now with the Bass Pro Tour guys. Now, the FLW Pro Circuit, there's a lot going on. One, it's a chance to go ahead and have a shot of fishing against the best probably another notch in that gun holster if you're a young gunslinger. And you're also fishing for the points. The points for that FLW championship, we're going to take the top 50, go to Sturgeon Bay, where these guys are going to fish in a major league fishing format. And let's don't lose sight of this. The top 10 accumulative points after two years, those guys get an automatic bid to the Bass Pro Tour. We're bringing 10 out of our Bass Pro Tour guys and we're taking the top 10 of the FLW Pro Circuit guys. And I'm telling you, what I saw the other week showed me we're going to add some studs to an already star-studded field. I think one of the things that we've learned over the past few months living in this country is nothing's guaranteed. And I, and I know there's a, there's a strong group of really good anglers on this pro circuit that th this is a turning point in their season, could be a turning point in their career. There are guys who have battled through uh, fishing outside of their comfort zone and, and in places that, that they're not familiar with. But, you know, guys like Josh Douglas, guys like Matt Steffen, that now we're coming to their part of the country. This, this is a, a part of the season where they're trying to turn the corner, make that championship, put themselves in position for, for a title run. And, and that, to me, is, is really the story. A lot going on in our country. The guys that can stay focused, block out all the distractions, turn off the news, and, and really break it down here at Lacrosse this week, they're going to turn the corner and finish and have a great season. Yeah, absolutely. And in a, a lot of emphasis on this uh, AOI race, right? These guys are trying to qualify for this championship coming up uh, at the end of the month. There's a lot of fishing that's going to go down <laughs> between today and the end of the month. And uh, here is a, a look at the top 10 right now on our leaderboard for that race. Ron Nelson, he's been amazing. He's only fishing his sophomore season on the uh, Tackle Warehouse Pro Circuit, but uh, last year's rookie of the year and now this year making a strong case for that angler of the year. Yeah, Ron's one of those guys from the northern part of this country from Michigan and I know he was licking his chops to see the schedule coming north, Wisconsin, Michigan, Lake Erie, whatever's coming. He, this is right in Ron's wheelhouse. If he can have a great event here at Lacrosse, I'm pretty sure he's going to distance himself from the rest of the pack, Marty. Yeah, but I look at a guy like John Canada. Ron better catch him here because this isn't the Alabama River, but Canada's from the Alabama area, and he understands these river-type fisheries. So 
this is an opportunity for him to really excel. He's had a tremendous, tremendous season. And let's not forget, Cox is not here, so we know that he's going to leave this less than, than third in the points. So these two have got a chance to separate themselves. But when I look at this list now, four through 10, you talking about young, hungry hammers coming to us. Most every one of these kids have got some kind of college background or some kind of youth background. Like with Sheffield, in his case, you know, he went to school of um, Professor Ron Sheffield. That was a pretty <laughs> Sheffield good college. University. Yeah, that was a pretty good college, sort of like the Jones University over the Bass Pro Tour. Good college to graduate from. Man, this is, it's a, it's a story feel going back to Ron Nelson's sophomore season. He took life in a different perspective. You know, he got, he took care of business, took care of life, got the family situated where he can come back and now fish more freely. You know, maybe a sophomore in years on tour, but a veteran of life and a veteran of fishing. What this guy's done in the last two years, it's almost like a Jacob Wheeler kind of run over here. Been very dominant. Absolutely, guys. A lot of exciting anglers coming up the ranks. And like you said, they might be uh, freshmen, sophomores on season, but they are not new to the sport of bass fishing. These guys, a lot of momentum and a pleasure to watch. But now we're going to jump down to Joshua Weaver talking about what he's expecting this morning. All right, guys. This is the fifth uh, term of the year we're in lacrosse or we're in stoddard wisconsin it got moved down here due to the covid restrictions and all that we're going out day one here we're making flw live tv today really excited about this tournament i had a really good tournament here last time so hopefully i can carry that momentum over this week the bite's a lot different this time obviously we're here a lot later in the summer supposed to be an unbelievable frog in here this time of year. It's not really happening. The bite's been tough, few and far between. When you do find them, though, you're, you normally get around a little wide of them. So I think I've got three or four located. I'm really looking forward to get out there today and seeing if they're still. Uh, day one, Mississippi River. I come into this tournament, and I've, I've been here once before, and I did really well, and I caught them on a frog when I was here before. And uh, the first day of practice, I did the chatterbait, swim jig, the whole thing, and never really caught nothing. Caught a bunch of pike, walleye, catfish, everything but a bass. And I picked up a frog and started getting bites. So I did it all day one, and then day two of practice, the only thing I did was, the only thing I caught anything was on a frog. And then yesterday, I tried different stuff, nothing worked. Come back to an area where I had some bites, and a lot of it was blown away, so that kind of, I was in a panic mode yesterday, but then kind of figured out where they went, and it was all on a frog. So. As you'll see today, and what's on the front of this boat, we have three frog rods, and that's all I'm going to do. I will do nothing else this whole tournament. This is, I don't, I don't, this is scary when you can honestly say I'm putting all my eggs in one basket, but all my eggs are in one basket. So it's something I love to do, it's something I'm very comfortable doing. Smallmouth is not my deal, so we're all in frogging today, all in. There's another live look. At our anglers looking like they're getting ready to blast off. That's looking pretty clear now. So uh, as these anglers head out onto the lake, or out onto the river rather, we will be joining them as soon as they start fishing. It was interesting to hear Davis break down his thought process of this. And, and I'm, I'm not going to armchair quarterback. But I, I'll tell you why I truly think this place is world-renowned for frog fishing. Normally, the best frog fishing happens when this river's higher. Okay, so right now, it's, it's just a touch south of seven foot as far as the river level goes. When these guys are here having great events, the river's around the 11, 12 plus stage. So it's up higher. Well, why is that a big deal? It floods those backwater areas. It floods those bayous. It floods those swampy type areas that the anglers can get to. And oh yeah, by the way, guess where those frogs live? In those areas. Now the water's 500 yards plus from those areas. So unless an angler can make a 500 yard cast, he's not near those frogs. Yes, they will come down to the edge of the water, but it makes it harder to be able to sustain a frog bite when the river is at this level. I saw that last year when we were here for Redcrest. Some of our guys caught some, but it's just, it's not the same when this river's high. 
and it's, it's, it's renowned for it, but it can give you a false sense. If you're not really dialed into the river levels, it can be too low for that to be the dominant bite. Todd, you've had some experience on this river. When you were here, I think it was up quite a bit higher. Yeah, and I think when you come to the, this part of the Mississippi River, that's what you just expect to do. That's what a lot of these guys want to do. And I, I'm going to say selfishly, I'm hoping a lot of these guys are throwing <laughs> frogs today because I want to watch them on live. I want to see those blow-ups. I don't even care if they're pike. Uh, I, you know, I, I talked to a lot of guys, too, that, you know, they would throw a frog with no hook or, you know, they, they would kind of tape up their hooks or something so they wouldn't catch the fish. And uh, I remember from being in, in lacrosse, like, sometimes you just get false clues in fishing. I call them false clues, but you, you think there's a deal. You think there's a bite that's going on, and you, and, and you might get a few clues, and they might lead you down the wrong path. So I'm curious to see, Marty, I, I, I think the frog's going to play, but not to the extent that we, we maybe expect it or like it has in the past. But... Uh, Interesting to hear Alex Davis right off the bat this morning saying he's throwing nothing but a frog. The thing I do like is the fact that it's his strength. <laughs> okay, TVA guy, this is a river that you can fish your strength. You're a smallmouth guy, get out on the river, they play. If you're a largemouth guy, backwater guy, then go do that. If you're that guy that likes to flip wood, then get in the back channels. This river will play to your strength. and try to, Instead of trying to reinvent yourself here, just... Be true to yourself, and then you'll know how to make the adjustments. We'll see. The frog will play enough that you can get by. But I think because this river is so choked out with eelgrass, we've lost a lot of the coontail and millful that these fish migrate to that then big frog bites end up. I think before this event's over with, we're going to see some anglers sit down in very small areas because the river's down. And what I saw last year when we were here in the Red Crest, whether it's a small backwater area, whether it's a small current break on the main river, whether it's a small ditch or, or gully that you, these anglers can find these fish, they'll be concentrated in very, very small areas. I don't think the way the river's playing, a guy's just going to be able to burn down the bank 500 yards, a half a mile, and be able to generate enough bites. They're going to have to get specifically dialed into little areas. Um, yeah, I mean, Todd, you mentioned you were excited about seeing some, uh, you know, frog fishing, uh, as am I. But let's talk a little bit more about these tactics. Are we going to see some topwater blowups uh, with some other baits? Um, what are the other tactics that are going to play out here today? Yeah, you know, the, the FLW Tour was here in 2017, and I, I remember fishing a Toyota Series event maybe a few years prior to that, I think 2015, uh, more in the, in the September area. But the, when we were here last time, 2017, the river was way, way higher. It was essentially flooded, and it was really a spawn bite. So uh, we saw much different tactics come into play. Uh, this week, what I've been hearing, you're going to see some pitching and flipping going on. Uh, there's a lot of vegetation. There, there's a lot of wood. There's a lot of laydowns. There, there's beaver dams that can come into play. Uh, but I think you're going to see a lot of guys pitching and flipping plastics. Uh, I, I definitely think you're going to see the frog come into play. I've heard these guys talk about massive flats of eelgrass this year uh, that caught them off guard. Uh, in fact, I talked to Joshua Weaver last night, and if you remember the event from 2017, he had a really special wing dam uh, that, that was kind of under the water and maybe three to five foot deep. He said, man, I went back to that this week, and, and it's covered in grass. And he said, the only way I can fish it now is with a frog, mm -hmm. where, where he was fishing more like a Senko and Carolina rig before. Uh, but th there's, there's a lot of options here, hard cover and grass being really key uh, stuff, Marty. But th there's also some offshore. There's some sand drops. There, talk about some of the intricacies of fishing the Mississippi River. Yeah, so when you're on the river, you, you've, got to, you've got to realize that when you're on the main river proper, it's all about the current in the bait fish and whatever causes a current break. These fish don't want to have to fight that current, so they're going to get around the hard cover, whether it's a lay down, a sand point, a rock pile, a wing dam, uh, even some of the spillways. And then when you move into those back channels like we're talking about on the breakdown, the back, there's a difference between back channels. Back channels are secondary channels, and they're on the main river. They have current in them. They have grass, and they also have laydowns. And then you've got guys that'll fish true backwater areas, like what we saw Edwin Evers when Redcrest, fish living all of the above. They absolutely live in all of the above. That's why you can fish your strength here. 
I think something else that we noticed in red crest that sort of caught us by surprise was a lot of fish caught on a vibrating jig. There was a lot of fish caught swimming a jig. There was a lot of fish caught cranking. This, like, this river system has got sh shallow underwater places that are accessible for those 1.5 crankbaits, crankbaits that run less than eight foot, that this place is so visual you can miss. If you're not truly paying attention as you're running, what created that current break? What created that eddy? What created that small pool? I think before this event's over with, we're going to see shallow running crankbaits be a major player. And this river's not known for that. You, know, you get something that you're so focused on, you either got to be punching or throwing a frog. With this group, if it's the obvious and there's this many anglers on here, I don't know if you can win a tournament doing the obvious against this bunch on the way this river's fishing this week. Uh, very good points, Marty. Uh, now, you mentioned, you know, that current being out towards the river or being these backwaters, no current. Um, can you now break out where the smallmouth and largemouth fit into that and what the strategies? I know that, you know, spring and fall, sometimes uh, those smallmouth are the bigger fish to target. Um, is that still at play in the summertime fishing like this? And are there anglers that are going to be targeting either or? Oh, that's, I mean, Travis, that's a great question. And, and so my comment to that is when you're on the main river, in most of the time you're going to be dealing with smallmouth. But this river, unlike anywhere we go, when I say cats and dogs coexist, they truly do, these smallmouth and largemouth truly do coexist together. Main river, primary smallmouth, a few large mary. Backwater channels where there's current running through there and it has uh, opening on both the front and the back of it, that's where they coexist a lot. You can catch a largemouth off a lay down, turn around, catch a smallmouth off a lay down. There's, there's a lot of coexisting, probably the largemouth are heavy. Then when you go straight up backwater, it's all about largemouth. And the anglers I talked to this week said by far the numbers of bites were the smallmouth. By far the heavier weighing fish on the river right now is largemouth. So now you've got some choices. Do you run to these wing dams? Do you run somewhere on underwater in the river? catch you that 10 to 12 pound limit of smallmouth quickly and then go all in on the back channels or backwater trying to catch those kicker largemouth or have you found something special enough that you have it to yourself in those backwater areas and that's where we're going to see in my opinion the potential of those 16 17 pound bags that live on this river but it's being very stingy to find right now. It's going to be interesting to see, Travis, uh, are the largemouth going to dominate this event? I heard the same thing, Marty, that the largemouth are heavier. They, they've been feeding up maybe. They're a little farther along post-spawn than some of the smallmouth. I heard the smallmouth were skinny. Uh, it w but will somebody be able to find a magical smallmouth area and catch those three to three and a half pound smallmouth that, that this part of the Mississippi River is known for? It's happened this time of the year. Uh, year in and year out, somebody stumbles onto an area with, with it's like a magical area for smallmouth. Uh, I'm curious to see if largemouth will dominate, if smallmouth will play, or if guys are going to end up catching both. Yeah, and how about what are the size we're looking for uh, this tournament? When we were here in 2017, it was in May. Um, you know, now that we're in uh, July right now, are these weights going to go down? It was. It took an average about 15 pounds a day for Brian Schmidt to win it last time. Are we going to see more like 12 to 13 pounds a day be holding up that trophy? Uh, Marty, I know you were talking about a little bit more this morning. What, what's your uh, ideas on these weights, that, the target weights these anglers are looking to, to get a check and advance in the tournament? Yeah, I really think that with the river fishing tougher, this is a, this is a full field, 200-plus boats. This is a massive amount of water, but these fish are living in small areas. I think when the smoke finally clears after two days, you were talking about 100 plus checks, you're going to look at 19 and a half pounds. I think you're going to be somewhere around that 12 and a half pound mark to make that first top 50 cut. I will be shocked if it doesn't take a 15 and a half pounds a day to end up winning the event. And the reason I say that is this river is loaded with two and a half pound fish and under. The key is going to be who can get that four pound bite, who can do it multiple days, and who can execute. That bite is gonna be like an eight or nine pounder at Chickamauga. That's truly those four and five pound bites on this river. They're here, they're few and far between, but they're game changers. Look there at Matt Steffen getting ready for takeoff as our field is uh, 
staged up there outside of the Stoddard boat ramp. So they start their first day here in Wisconsin. There's, uh, doing well in the points race, 22nd. He's also no, one of those guys. Changed anything that I'm doing, I'm committed to go up the. Those northern anglers uh, excited about it coming uh, north. Yeah. The plan is to catch 12 plus pounds and then lock back down as soon as I can. There's been so much barge traffic this week that I just really don't want to tempt fate and try to push it up there. There's plenty of fish in Pool 8 we can come down to and try to upgrade down here. Um, I'm really kind of hoping that maybe this prohibits or prevents some people from going up to Pool 7 or Pool 9. Might change their game plans, losing an hour and a half. You know, I feel like I've got some fish that are pretty dialed in or locked in where I should be able to, to run to them and catch them still. So it doesn't change much. It may have a little bit of an out... Uh, of a of a change on the weights for the day they might be a little bit lower just because we've lost some time but in general i i don't think it changes much for myself Two hundred and three anglers blasting off. Full field will fish days one and days two, and only the top fifty will move on to day three, and the top ten of those will move on to fish the fourth and final day. This game moves at such a rapid pace, and what I mean by that, being a professional angler, you you you've got the three days of practice, you've got all the prep time it takes, you've got your game plan, you've got things established, you're committed all in. Lock up, lock down, stay in this pool. Then real time hits, fog delay, hour and a half gone out of your day. Now what? Now what? That's the tough decisions that I don't think the world appreciates that these guys have got to make. And it's it's changing by the second and by the each barge that ends up in that lock. Todd, you've been in these events before. Last thing you want to do is run all the way up north, 22 miles from there, try to lock up, and there sits a barge. And now you're waiting another hour to get in, and you're going to give up two hours possibly coming back if you've got the wrong traffic. I mean, these are tough, real-time decisions. You can't win this event today, but you can dang sure lose it, and you don't want to do it sitting there looking at a bunch of barges. Tournament bass fishing definitely a game of decisions, and you know sometimes you're right and, and you make the right call, and other times you're wrong and you drive the plane into the ground. <laughs> it doesn't turn out well, and it's bad as a bad move. Here's what I heard from Matt Steffen that I thought was key this morning, Marty, and that's uh, the guys who are deciding to lock now, especially if you're due in early, if you're in one of those first few flights, right? You've lost some some really important time right now. What I heard Matt Steffen say was this, if you're going to lock now and you're going to have to come back two hours early or something to, get, be, to give yourself enough time with barge traffic, if you're going up to pool seven or you're going down to pool nine, you better be going straight to some fish. Yeah. You better be going, because you may only have you know, three, three hours or so of fishing time. You can't put yourself in a position to go up to seven or go down to pool nine and not be on something. And what, what I heard him say was, I hope that keeps more people in pool eight, because you know Matt's, Matt's decision has been to lock and go to another pool. And he's dialed. And I think you're going to see guys do that. Uh, I'll be, I'll be, I think all three pools are in play this week, Marty. I, I don't think uh, this fishery is so good. It, it's, not, it's not like some other rivers where you have to lock into a certain pool to compete. I think we're going to see guys make the cut and on live. Uh, come later this week that are in pool seven, eight, and nine. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I 100% agree with you. Last year when we were preparing for Redcrest, I had the privilege of riding two days with Tom Monsoor on this river. And then I spent a day and a half with Gary Klein. I was checking some bucket list trips there. And we covered all the pools. And all of them have their unique characteristics about of them, but all of them are good. 
I still say I'm, I think it's going to come down to what Stephen was talking about, being dialed in. When I hear dialed in on this river, what that normally tells me is you've got a small area. You're going to make the same cast repetitively, repetitively and catch fish. That's dialed in. I don't think dialed in is having a backwater area that's 500 yards long and you've got to fish through it. That's having a good spot. You hope it works out. When I hear dialed in, and I think you can be dialed in on 7, 8, or 9. I really do. I think the guys are truly dialed in. They don't need long. They don't need long to be able to catch what they got to catch. I was a tournament angler that every time I tried to lock or every time I tried to make a ginormous run, 70% of the time it never worked out. And I liked having the option of staying close. Talking about experience, here's the guy. David Dudley getting ready to blast off. Little audio difficulties. We're, we're, we're going to work on that. But that was David Dudley looking calm as ever. He's lived through these kind of battles. You know, you're talking about real-time decisions at the moment, on the moment, during the moment. He's had to live through these time and time again. So this is nothing that he's not accustomed to. And, and Todd, you made an interesting point earlier. We got a lot of, you know, we talk about the youth movement over here. Well, the youth movement on a body of water like this means it's the first time you've ever been here. You can run into ground here in a heartbeat. If the red can and the green can doesn't mean something to you, and then when you get outside of those channels, just these backwater channels and backwater areas, they're ginormous. And as when I was riding around with Tom Mansour, they change year to year. Him and I almost got stuck a time or two. So it, this can be overwhelming for an angler first time. Now we're looking at Edwin Evers, who's got a 300,000 fond memory of this place from last year. What's up, fishing world? Yes, we are here at Lacrosse, and I got—I know they've talked about it a million times this morning. We got a fog delay, blah blah blah. But actually, I'm kind of happy that we had a fog delay because they have taken away our day off. So I have sat here for however long, rig and tackle what I normally would do on our day off. So I've enjoyed this fog delay, and I'm ready to get started. Hopefully we can learn something together. Fishing is tough. You're going to hear that a little bit today, I'm sure. But lacrosse is not fishing the way it seems to be in years past. But uh, we're going to go out there and give it our best. I am going down to Pool 9, and they're going to talk about the barge traffic. I'm sure they're going to talk all about the barges and delays. And do you take a gamble? Well, I'm taking a gamble. I'm going down to Pool 9. Uh, I feel that's where I need to be for me. It probably is, might be a good decision, might not be bad of a decision. I don't know. That's what makes fishing so interesting. So I'll tell you a quick story real quick. Fishing never seems to amaze me. So I found this little point uh, in practice, and I threw every cast I was catching like eight inch or 10 inch or eight inch or 10 inch or eight inch or 10 inch or, and then I caught one that may have kept and then I just was catching all these little bitty bass. So yesterday evening I go back there and I'm like, I, I, I kind of want to check to see if they're still there. Throw it up there as soon as I threw up there, it was like, Dunk! one smoked it. I said, took is like a 13 incher, which is a giant on that school. I didn't, I don't even know if I caught a 13 incher on that school. Throw it back again, as soon as it hits the bottom, Dunk! One bites it. I said to hook, it's a 
14 and a quarter inch. I'm like, oh man, that's cool. Throw back again, doom, another keeper, doom, another keeper. And it fishing is such a mind boggling sport because it's like you think that it would be all 10 inches and eight inches there again. And yet I go there, check it and practice and it seemed to be there was a few keepers there. Of course, I'm going to try it this morning. Now, whether or not they're keepers or non-keepers, I don't know, but fishing is a crazy sport, crazy sport. And I'm sure you'll hear me talking that through in my head. These fish drive me nuts. All right, so we're an uh, hour and 45 minutes after we were supposed to originally start the blast off. We're about to head out there. Um, it's bright sun, sun, uh, sun shining now, so I, I don't really know. I was hoping to kind of get a little bit of a morning bite, but uh, hopefully there'll still be some fish in there biting when we get there, and uh, should know pretty quick whether they're there or not, so uh, y'all stay tuned, and uh, hopefully we'll be about, about to put a show on for y'all. Marty, one of the young guns here on the Tackle Warehouse Pro Circuit, 26 years old, down from Macon, Georgia. He finished second here in lacrosse in 2017, and he sounded very confident when I talked to him last night. And let's add to this, too. You know, these guys here at FLW Pro Circuit, they get to work together. They get to talk. They get to share information. One of his, ro his roommate is Cody Meyer, and Cody drew... Josh, uh, several years ago, was a co-angler, and just, he said, Marty, I fell in love with his personality, his work ethic, everything about, and for Cody Meyer to say that, that's a big deal, so he, this young man's having a breakout year, in my opinion, and then to be able to have the wisdom of a Cody Meyer in the evening to be able to talk to, who's energetic, who's positive, who, when you look at everything that's right about our sport, He's one of the pitchers you're going to look at. So I think there's a good influence going on there. But I'm the fan of outside looking in. Here's another one I'm glad I'm going to get to watch all day today, too. Alex Davis, <clears throat> all in on the frog. Fixing to start day one. Uh, fog delay finally lifted. Now you can see. It didn't, I don't think, I mean, of course I want the extra hour and a half of fishing, but I don't think it's going to hurt. I'm not having to worry about locking, going any other place. So I got still right at eight and a half hours to fish. So that's uh, hopefully plenty. Hopefully we don't need that. Hopefully I can catch him without the first two and then can just kind of expand on what I've been doing. So that's the plan. We're going to go catch us some and thank goodness we get to go fishing. Alex was really talking about simplifying things, and you know, we, he talked about the frog t this morning. About that was he, that was his go-to. He was going to live or die by the frog, uh, at least for today. Um, the other thing, when talking to him last night, uh, he says he hates uh, locking up and down. He hates the the uncertainty of that, and so he spent all his time pre-fishing in pool eight. He he wants to uh, eliminate as many variables as you can, and and so by him staying in pool eight, by him really focusing on that frog bite, uh, you know, he's going to know at the end of today. And I like the strategy out. of all in and, and pull eight. It's big. It's 22 miles long, three miles wide. You can have a lifetime and never get to all the backwater areas. Add into that the Black River area as well. Um, those backwater channels down there around George Island, I believe it's called. I mean, this place is huge. And to be able to pick a pool and say, this is it, and I don't disagree. I mean, the barge traffic is, is a player this week. 
One of the things I always find interesting too, Marty, you know, I'm looking at Alex Davis. He's starting this event in 29th place in the points, and you're going to see some guys play it safe. You know, getting locked out, getting stuck behind a barge in a different pool and not getting to weigh your fish in could be the difference in you making that title championship or not. So uh, maybe, a, maybe a wiser decision and uh, making the most of pool eight, trying to catch 11, 12 pounds and, and finish middle of the pack, finish in the money and make it into that title championship. Then other guys, I talked to John Canada last night, comes into this event in second place. He's rooming with Ron Nelson. They, they talk a lot. But he said, look, I'm in position to win Angler of the Year, and I'm going to gamble. I I'm going for it. He's going to lock, and he's going to. So you're going to see some guys take some gambles. You're going to see some guys play it safe. The points comes into play at this point in the season, and uh, certainly part of their decision-making process. The, on the John's case, too, you don't want to go into the last event chasing Ron Nelson knowing that we're probably going to offshore smallmouth fisheries. Okay, that, that's, that's, gonna, that's a tough mountain to overcome. You know, if Nelson gets to one of these smallmouth fisheries and he's got the lead, there's a very good chance that he's going to keep the lead. And I'm going to add to this, too. The Bass Pro Tour guys, they're not here fishing for points. They're here fishing for money. They have nothing to lose and everything to gain. That could be the group that's just going to say, let's go lock up or down, and whatever happens with the bar just happens with them because there's no implications on the point side of that. So a lot of different intricacies going on in this particular event. We, and so that brings up another question I have, guys. So, um, I mean, Alex Davis was a perfect example of this, but we also have the rest of the field. We're paying down to 100th place. So uh, where is uh, the mindset of making sure you don't leave money? Because only one guy gets to drive home with that trophy, right? right. But, but 100 anglers are going to get to cash checks this, this event. How do you make sure, and, and do you actually fish to make sure you don't miss out on some money, or is it do you have to full throttle all the way down and not worry about that, or you're just going to lose it anyway? I think, I think it's, there's two different mindsets in this group. There, there's one group that's here to jackpot. They're here to make money, uh, and, and some of them, you know, we, we watched Andy Morgan up at Chickamauga, and I was really shocked. I felt like Andy went for the $10,000 check and maybe passed on Lake Chickamauga, locked up to Watts Bar, but some of, this is a business for some of these guys, right? And they're just, they're trying to make money. Uh, in fact, I would call it three different mindsets. You have one angler that's just here to make money, and so $10,000 is $10,000. I don't care what envelope they put it in, it all cashes the same. Then there's another guy who maybe is way back in the pack, right? Or, or is a, is a uh, maybe a major league fishing guy who's, who's very well off financially, very stable at this point. They're going for the win. They have nothing to lose. And then you have other guys who are going to play it safe. We talked about the points race. Uh, you know, guys, guys that are just trying to live for that title championship. Guys, even like Matt Steffen, you know, he told me, he said, man, I feel like if, we, if I can make it uh, to that title championship, I'm going to contend. I know guy, other guys, from uh, the smallmouth guys, the, the Gray Buck, the Matt Beckers, uh, will they play it safe, try to catch 10 or 12 pounds? But those are the three different mindsets that I see coming into this, and uh, a lot of different guys are going to play in this event. I always looked at events that when you come into an event, you never were thinking about a check. You're thinking about how to make a top 10 and how to win. I think the check mindset, at least for the experienced angler, it comes somewhere through two-thirds of the day, your first day. All right, this is not working out. I don't have exactly what I thought I was going to have. How do I salvage the event? How do you go about And there's an art. There's an absolute art to salvaging in a day and salvaging an event. And with a five-fish limit, that art gets, in my opinion, just a touch bit easier. Salvage the day, catch five, live to fight again. But I think it's somewhere about two-thirds through that first day of competition because when every one of these guys blast off, they're thinking top ten, how to win. At least, in my opinion, as an experienced tournament angler, that's where your focus should be. If you start the event going, I'm going to fish for a check, normally that's a disaster waiting to happen. It's just, it's, it's too conservative. This group's too good. If all you're doing is trying to just tread water, you're going to sink like a rock. <laughs> well, we're about to find out who's going to float and who's going to sink like a rock. These anglers are out blasting off on the Mississippi River. Guys, we're going to take a short break, but we will be right back, hopefully, with some live fishing here for stop number five of the Tackle Warehouse Pro Circuit Super Tournament presented by Optima Batteries. <laughs> 